So uh, my, I'm Brother Judah, and I'm really excited to be talking tonight uh, on the subject of killing time is wounding eternity and the kingdom impact. Uh, before we get started, um, I would like to start with some prayer. Um, Brother David Hoffman, uh, would you feel free to uh, pray for this? Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, for all the young men that are going to be on this call and that are going to watch it after we record it. Lord, I pray, God, that you bless Brother Judah, God. I pray, Lord, that you uh, speak through him, God. I pray, God, that you give him wisdom, God, and give him power. And Lord, I pray that you just let him be a conduit for your spirit, for your word, and let us uh, have a great time tonight. Same. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Hoffman. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about killing time is wounding eternity and the kingdom impact. Uh, so for, first of all, we, we all see where uh, time management is to be the key for meeting deadlines and certain expectations. Well, Jesus gave us the expectation that we are to be meeting, and that is the great commandment. He told us in Matthew 28 to go into all nations, teaching them, baptizing them, and teaching them whatsoever he has commanded us and he's taught us that we're to do that for this world. And so that's our first expectation for, from Jesus that we're needing to do for the world. And uh, going on is it will only happen when we teach and live lives that are prosperous in and for the kingdom. And we're in balance with the word. So if we're not walking perfectly with God's word, we're not going to be able to make the impact that we're needing to. So boil down, it comes down to faithful walking and God's perfect timing until we die. Then we either meet or we're going to bomb our deadline. Um, unfortunately, there's no redo overs. There is no ability to make up for past mistakes. We either get it right or we either get it wrong. And so we need to first of all, first and foremost, walk in the spirit, walk with God and allow him to lead us, guide us and direct us. And so as leaders, we must help our students to understand what is that perfect time learning to balance those deadlines, so to speak, that deadline of I could die tomorrow. Am I doing all that I can be doing? And what is that expectation of me as a student? What is my expectation? What can I do? Uh, a lot of times as students, uh, we have students that are overzealous and and they might um, overthink things. Or we might have students that don't even give themselves enough credit. Of They might have the Holy Ghost. They might be baptized in Jesus' name and actually have a good understanding of the Word of God. But they're filled with fear. And so with them, we're wanting to move them along the spectrum of wisdom instead of being um, really full of their own understanding, being full of the wisdom of the Lord and allowing them to lean onto that wisdom. And so helping them to not uh, belittle their days of small, but to see the value of their days of small. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the first portion here. Um, it's kind of split up into three sections, um, this opening here, that we're going to be talking about time management for faithful development. And then we're, we're going to go into the kingdom impact. And then we're going to conclude it all up and we'll be done this evening. All right. So um, getting into um, these things is they need to know that success isn't something that they will do or achieve. If they're waiting to do something or waiting to achieve something, they're going to wait their entire life and miss the opportunities right in front of them. That's an, uh, the idea of I'm going to go and achieve something or I'm going to go do something and that's going to be my success. That's an idea of our works being our success. Our works are not going to be our success. Our success is when we make heaven our home and we get to bring somebody with us. That is our success. Uh, a little quote that I like is, if you can meet success and failure, treat them both as imposters. Because it's the idea of you're waiting for some great thing to happen when the great thing is already before you. You got to seize the opportunity that God has placed in your life, whether it's something big or even if it's something small, you got to be shown faithful in that, uh, what you're doing. Failure is not failing to achieve some ministry or some leadership role or falling into sin. Now, it's failing when you decide to not get back up from falling. Everybody's going to fall at some point. Everybody's going to mess up. And, and I'm not necessarily saying a sin aspect. I'm saying you, you zigged uh, and didn't minister to somebody when you were supposed to. So, Sometimes we're not always going to do what we're supposed to, but you got to learn from those things and get back up and start to do right. Uh, failing is not uh, is choosing to not get redeemed. We have to live in the redemption of God, or else you're never going to walk in the places that God has you to walk in. And uh, failing is choosing to stay stupid. 
I know it's kind of an offensive word to say sometimes is stupid, but stupid is as stupid does. If you choose to keep making those same decisions and expect different outcomes, that is the definition of stupid. If you're not seeing success, that success is probably not the right definition. You need to look at what God is wanting, what God is choosing, or what God is trying to have you to do to show faithful walking. So as all of us, as leaders, um, as part of the youth board, pastors, and et cetera, is we are all students of the word of God, and we're all students in this life. And if we don't learn to keep in remembrance what the success is, it's going to set us up for many failures. Paul talks about not placing um, young individuals and people into ministries too quickly and allowing the Lord to mature them. There is a process that needs to happen. Now, sometimes we think that it's a long, drawn out process and it's not going to be until you're in your 30s or 40s to do that successful thing, whatever that ministry might be. But this is the problem is, a ministry title or being a leader of sorts, that isn't the end goal of success. The success is right here today, right in front of you, in your schools, in your hallways, in your conversations. Success is here today when you decide to make the right choice and to follow the Spirit of God. And when you don't, you are allowing for the enemy to win in that battle. And we got to stop allowing the enemy to win every little battle and start taking back what God has given to us. So sometimes, like I said, that development process, it can be spans of years, which we've all seen, but sometimes God also does an exponential process through trials and tribulations. In Romans chapter five, the Bible says that trials and tribulations are for our perfecting. God wants to perfect us through trials and tribulations so we can minister to those that are hurting, minister to those that are in need of that wisdom that God has brought us through maybe our hardships and things that we've had to go through and to endure. Sometimes hardships are not by our own choosing. Poverty is not always by our choosing. Um, dealing with certain issues might not be our choosing, but it's choosing to stay in it is a different thing. God has given us wisdom and how to get out of those things, but you have to make the choice to follow God in it. So with all that being said, is now it's on to time management for faithful development. So here we go. Ephesians chapter 5, 15 through 16, it says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We live in evil days. We all know that. But with God, you cannot stand around and wait for an opportunity to happen. God says that you have to walk and you have to work circumspectly. So uh, with that is standing is going to cause you to start to look around the landscape around you. You're going to start comparing yourself to someone else's life, comparing yourself to somebody else's ministry. Well, my ministry is not this, or my ministry is not that. I'm not even in ministry yet. I, I'm not doing what so-and-so is doing. It gives you uh, the I don't haves, and it starts putting all this anxiety on you that God never designed you to carry or to walk with. The other thing is with walking as a physical therapist, I have the opportunity of analyzing people's gait patterns. And if somebody's not walking appropriately, it's going to lead to issues. Everybody can walk. I don't care. Go to the mall. You're going to see tons of people walking. But you're going to also see people walking incorrectly. And there's a perfect way to walk according to the Word of God. And we're going to get into that in a minute. So when we're measuring on that consistency, when Peter stopped walking, he started looking. And when he started looking, he started to sink. We don't want to be sinking. We want to continue to rise above the trials, the storms, and the situations in our life. When David stopped fighting the good fight, he started lusting after his own flesh. Before we run the race of ministry, we need to first set aside every weight and distraction and sin, according to Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. And before we can run the race of ministry, we first need to learn to walk in the spirit of excellence. James 1 and 17 talks about every perfect gift comes from the Father above or the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5.25, it says that we are to walk in the Spirit. So we need to walk in the Spirit of excellence because the Spirit will teach you what you are needing to say in that very hour. So when we look back at Ephesians chapter 5 and 15, it says that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What is circumspectly? I always assumed walking circumspectly means to walk around, being cunning, being smart, looking for traps. That would make pretty good sense. Uh, if you have any sense of etiology to yourself. But the word circumspectly, it simply means to walk 
the most exact or the most straightest, not just straight, but to the utmost straight. It's stressing how narrow of a path that you got to walk. Wide is the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to to the those gates. We got to take that narrow path. We can't just um, walk circums walk in a, any fashion that we want to. We have to walk walk circumspectly. We have to walk to the utmost straightest possibility. So it's not good enough to just know a little about that straight path. You will simply overestimate your opinion of what it is. You have to know what that straight path is. And you have to live it. You have to walk it and you have to study it. Um, when bank tailors are learning about fraudulent money, they don't learn studying fake money. They learn by observing and studying the real thing. Because if it doesn't look like the real thing, you're going to know that it's not the real thing. So we must first teach wisdom and walking by walking in unity with the Spirit. If we want our young people to go and minister in their schools, we need to teach them by example that we first have to walk the walk of faith, walking a faith walk. Then we can run that run that marathon as a, as a minister. So uh, we got to also work on not placing and, and pushing our young people into ministries too early, not hindering them because they're too young or we perceive something. We got to follow the Spirit of God. God has placed every person on a different path of development. Like I said earlier, is that God has certain people that he is going to exponentially grow their wisdom so they can hurry up and get into the position that he wants for them. Or he might have them on a long journey in that place of gaining wisdom to how to walk appropriately with God and to follow his spirit. So we can't be the judge of that. We got to allow God to lead in that aspect. And so... Um, Moving on here, uh, this is why Student Ministries has been focusing in our conferences uh, for the past few conferences on answering why. Why do we do this? Why do we believe this thing? Why do we um, participate in such a fashion? It's because we have to have an understanding of what is our calling? What is our purpose? What is it that I am capable of doing right now? When I think of myself at the bottom of the totem pole, I might not be uh, some pastor uh, Kenneth Carpenter. I might not be some uh, pastor Pastor Lichen or um, um, Pastor Gill, but I am who I am in Christ. Christ has called me. God has called me to reach my world. He didn't call Pastor Kenneth Carpenter to reach my world. He called me to reach my people in my school and in my domain of circle. And so with that is I have to walk that faithful walk before I start running. See, the thing is, is when we start walking, if we're not using the correct walk, it's going to affect how you run. You have to first learn how to walk appropriately. So how's it going to affect our kingdom impact? Well, to have a good walk, we have to have what's called fat living. So we have to be faithful, available, and teachable. If you can't be fat in your walk with God, you're not going to run very well. So uh, as a little bit of an example is, and I'm not here to say that one is better than another, but to try to kind of draw out some uh, stark comparisons here is between Peter and Paul. Both were amazing and wonderful um, apostles of, uh, of Jesus and even disciples. But there's, so there's something to be learned between the both of them. Peter was faithful to Jesus, uh, but was often, um, he was often drawn to traditions and emotions. He cut the ear off of a Roman soldier for feeling zealous towards the Messiah. In Acts chapter 10, he denied the fact that the Lord was accepting of the unclean at first because God was trying to show him that he wanted to call the Gentiles unto him. And he said, this can't be. I refuse it because he was a Jew first. In Galatians chapter 2, uh, he held to this whole clean and unclean doctrine. He was torn between personal opinion and what God was trying to move him towards. But Peter was available. He was faithful first. He was faithful to the Jewish customs like he was supposed to and all that he knew. But as soon as he learned of Jesus, he was available to God and allowing him to be taught what God wanted. And so with that, uh, Apostle Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles because he was willing and it was available to God and saying, you know what, here's my personal opinions. Here's my personal thoughts and desires. I give them to you. And as such, he went on to read 
uh, to write most of the, the New Testament. He went on to be the leader of the church, though Peter preached the first sermon. It's not always about who starts running first. It's about who starts walking and walks faithful and runs with patience. You got to have those two things hand in hand, and you got to walk in the spirit or else you're going to fail at some time. You might fall short of the glory of God. What if Peter was supposed to have been the Paul uh, of his generation, but because he was unwilling to be available like he should, and I'm not saying that Peter wasn't a great apostle because he was everything that he was supposed to be. I do believe that because the Bible is perfect and true. But as men, we do fall and fall to the short of the glory of God, and he has to raise others up in our stead. So I'm saying all this to say is that we need to walk the walk of faith before we try running. And kind of going on a little bit more with this contrast between Peter and Paul, Peter was slow to being taught. Like I said, he held on to those traditions uh, of the Jewish faith. Paul, on the other hand, was faithful to the traditions that God was teaching him more quickly and was faithful to what Jesus had to say. And as such, he was an available choice tool for shaping the church. Um, Jesus said that he was, that he called him because he was a chosen tool. And so one can only teach if they first learn to be taught. Paul was an excellent teacher because he first learned how to be a student of Jesus. So because Paul learned how to be taught, he made the single largest kingdom impact arguably. And I already talked about those facts and all that. So the in kingdom impact will only come through fat living and walking with God's spirit. So in order to make a kingdom impact, we need to make a culture of faithful walkers power walkers and runners and we need leaders and students that will redeem the time and will do so by this let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and in purity till i come give attendance to reading to exhortation and to doctrine neglect not the gift that is in thee so don't neglect the holy ghost that god has put in you don't neglect the gifts that God is imputing into you. Don't be frightened. Don't be intimidated by anything else that's going on. You walk in faithfulness to the word of God and the teachers that God has put in your life and being obedient to that, which was given the by prophecy with the laying on of hand of the presbyter. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And that's 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 16. So in concluding is that we first have to learn how to walk a faithful walk with God, being faithful, being available, being teachable, not assuming that we know exactly what God wants, but getting in the spirit of God and allowing him to lead us, teach us. When we're deciding to try to do things on our own accord and our own thoughts, it is going to negatively impact our generation. King David served his generation by the will of God because he first had a heart after God. We first have to have a heart after God in order to walk the walk that we need to. So in conclusion is if we teach our young people to be like the tree in Psalms chapter one, verse three, um, blessed is the man that dwells and meditate in the word day and night. If you're going to meditate in the word of God day and night, think upon it, dwell on it. It's going to seep down into your soul very deeply. And you're going to start to walk a faithful walk because you're going to have a love for God. It starts with a love thing. We're going to only affect our world as if we love God all that much more and walk closer towards it and draw closer towards him. And we're going to produce those fruits um, of, of success as, as pe people might see it. We're going to develop those fruits of, of being kind, of being loving when we are having that faithful development with God. And so with that is um, I, I really encourage everyone to um, work on talking to their youth, teaching them about how God is wanting them to be faithful, fat walkers and being teachable. When you're being teachable, you're going to teach others. And as you teach others, you're going to uh, fulfill that great commandment that God has given us. So I'd like for everybody to take a second. You can unmute yourselves if you want to. 
I would all, all like for us to just take a moment, pray, ask that God would help us to uh, take in what he has given us here today and that we would take it back to our students, to our fellow friends, and allow God to make us faithful walkers. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you do. I thank you, God, for this lesson that you have given us tonight. Lord, I know it may be short, but God, I know that your word has gone forth and teaching us, God, that we have to be faithful to the kingdom of God and being teachable, being available, not holding to our own opinions, our own thoughts, but Lord, holding true to the words that you have given us, God, walking in your spirit, God, choosing you first and foremost, not waiting on anything else, but waiting on you and your perfect timing, God. I ask Jesus that you would help uh, the LJC student ministries, God, to continue to grow and to thrive. I ask God that you'd help all of us youth pastors, youth leaders, all those that are involved in, in trying to touch our youth, God. I ask God that you would help us, God, to walk the walk, God, that is going to model to them, Lord, the things that they are needing for their life. I ask God that you'd help us, God, as leaders, Jesus, that we would be led in the spirit when we're counseling them, that as leaders, God, that we would allow the spirit to work in us and through us. And I ask Jesus that you would go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.